This is the last chapter in the Political Ideologies class, The Future of Ideology. We'll be looking at some themes that we've talked about throughout the class and see kind of where they're headed. We see some increasing differences in various ideologies, even in America, split between the welfare and the classical liberalists that we talked about, essentially what became the Democrats and the Republicans. They uh, do seem to agree on the value of individual liberty. That is one of the, at the heart of liberalism, but tend to disagree on government's role on things such as inequality, opportunity, corporate power, or the promotion of that liberal liberty. So we'll talk in a few minutes how this could seem to be getting a little bit more polarized. We have seen the over the past few decades, the collapse of communism, but particularly as we got into the 90s, that precipitated this concept of ethno-nationalism that we've talked about quite a bit, which is at the heart of most of the conflict in the world. We have seen an increase in radical Islamism, as, which has led to several terrorist organizations that we've touched on, as well as the white nostalgia, which is then morphed into the uh, the hate groups that we've uh, discussed. What are some of the continuing forces in our ideologies? The Enlightenment, of course, one of the biggest turning points in humanity as far as figuring out how to use science and reason and how to govern ourselves. Still some universal elements from the Enlightenment, including the individual liberty the alleviating the class divisions for these individuals to enjoy their life. In the national loyalties, that was not the intent, still not the intent, to coalesce for uh, national purposes. However, we are seeing somewhat of a resurgence of that, of nationalism. Now, the nationalism was behind some of the anti-colonial movements, which did lead to quite a bit of um, the independences that came about, particularly post-World War II. But these old antagonisms between nations proved more powerful than any allegiance to a common ideology. So we just had a tendency to group back up into national sentiments, and the conflicts within states are through this ethno-nationalism. As I've said before, there's more conflict within states than there is between states. And as a result, over the past several decades, that's led to new terms, even though they've been happening throughout humankind. We've uh, added some new terms to our vernacular, ethnic cleansing and genocide, where one group of people will attempt to virtually exterminate another group of people. We've seen various separatist movements, and these are not just in the, in the poor, developing, or unstable countries. The, there are separatist movements that we've touched on that in Quebec, Quebec had wanted to separate from Canada. The Bosques have attempted to separate from Spain. Scots, Scotland has attempted to separate from the United Kingdom. Then in the United States, the alt-right movement, which we hit on very briefly, but it was more of a conservative Republican uh, offshoot that kind of similar to the Tea Party, went uh, a little bit more conservative, and then taking it even further, that where there would be the, the white nationalists that have used that white na- nostalgia to come back and, and organize they have been responsible for somewhat uh, increasing throughout the world, but they have also led to increased anti-immigration sentiment. Over the past decades have produced more of the English laws where people are required to speak English and various restrictions to programs to minorities or uh, immigrants. Religion will continuously be a major factor in ideologies in the world where 
Religion is, is a faith that is somewhat natural to us, but when certain elements of faith turn into ideologies, this is where they can have uh, political consequences. Going back to Karl Marx considered it the opium of the people that kept them sedated somewhat when they could be paying more attention to their current lives and political matters. So how do you incentivize people not to, to do that? And if you do, that might be in getting into their own private worlds. And so does that mean that religion should be left alone to be a private, their own personal private matter? In the democracies, the separation of church and state is still a very strong liberty that allows people to worship whatever religion that they want. And at the same time, the state is not going to to establish a national religion. Religion has flourished in most parts of the world. Christianity does seem to be generally declining. Islam generally increasing to where within a decade, they'll have about the same number of inherents throughout the world. The religious right, particularly starting in the 70s and the 80s, started to have more of an influence on the American conservative, had some uh, political influences there, also somewhat of an inspiration of some Republican Party factions. And the fundamentalists, and of course this is within any religion, was, would have extremist and fundamentalist elements. They are typically reacting against the spread of secularism, whether it's in Christianity where fundamentalist extremist movements are pushing back against modernization in a certain way, or in Islam, where they are pushing back against the, particularly the Western-style modernization. Several movements, such as the National Conference of Catholic Bishops, have made some impact over the years as far as using their religion to speak out against certain political issues. They condemned nuclear war way back, as immoral. Just recently, the, the city sanctuary movements that have uh, kind of pushed back against the federal government to help immigrants that are either seeking asylum or waiting to be recognized, well, the religious element has had some influence on these sanctuary movements that have defied the immigration policies and housed refugees. Pope John Paul II He had warned against a blind faith in capitalism. Pope Francis, current pope, has come out as a critic of consumerism as well as opposed to border walls that uh, prevent more integration between countries. There's also been the use of scripture to justify anti-gay versus pro-gay groups And in the Methodist Church, the disagreement over the allowing of gay ministers has actually resulted in the Methodist Church splitting off to where one church will allow that, another church will not. As far as public policy goes, looking at the U.S., our two-party system, as I've already touched on several times, does seem to be widening the divide between them, more polarization, there's more quarreling factions between them, more tribal mentality. It does seem to be filtering more into public. So you might start seeing a polarization out there in society as well. As people start to take up more sides, it could even starting to be filtering into the press somewhat. Now, even though our two-party system is pretty much ensconced in our society, it is also a mistake to think that the parties themselves are monolithic. We've had several offshoots of the major parties over the years that have made various impacts of the dynamic nature of ideologies, particularly if you look at just a general liberal or a general conservative conservative ideology, they have the tendency to develop these fissures and factions within them. 
in recently because of this polarization, those claiming to be independent is near an all-time high in the United States. And that could actually pro provoke some action of third-party development, perhaps even more moderate coalitions. We've talked quite a bit about the environment and environmental policy, ecology as an ideology, our material progress and our so-called mastery of nature, which humans have attempted ever since we've become human in order to try to make our lives more comfortable. That, of course, has been a mixed blessing as we are seeing effects on our environment, and that resulted in the emergence of this green ideology, which is increasingly has more potential policy to address these problems of the environment. But we also have to watch out for certain backlashes. This could lead to a reaction against state coercion to prevent us from doing certain things in order to help the environment. People could push back against that. And unfortunately, volunteering to give up our current benefits, particularly in the rich states, volunteering to sacrifice certain things in order to help the environment for the entire globe. That is unlikely. That's part of that tragedy, the commons that we talked about. So some amount of legislation may be necessary if we are going to uh, pursue this. And that, of course, could result in some disgruntlement. As a result, we might start turning to leaders who are promising to protect the status quo, to protect the way things are so that we do not have additional policies or requirements that we are supposed to do in order to uh, improve the environment. So we could start, again, pushing back against that, going to leaders. And we do have, we have an example of that with the current administration in the United States, which used the environment as kind of a policy tool Globalization, the increasing capitalism uh, or the capitalist uh, system of the world that is been underway, likely to continue. Benefits of free trade have been talked about a little bit. That promotes efficiency, the idea of comparative advantage that you make products that you are good at making. I'll make products that I'm good at making, and then we'll trade for those products. Having a global Market space gives you a larger bargaining space in which to let that supply versus demand mechanism work and find the best product for the best price. This rewards producers and benefits consumers in general. But there has been, over the past couple of decades, quite a bit of pushback, complaint against the global capital system. Critics cite working too much and getting paid less. We have seen that wages have somewhat leveled off, stagnated over the past few decades. Globalization is a, a factor to that. Uh, outsourcing is a factor, but of course, increasing technological innovation and automation and computerization of our work is contributed more to that than outsourcing has. But nevertheless, lower labor costs, if we go and find lower labor costs in other countries, that does tend to keep labor costs around the world down. The search for investment in foreign countries and perhaps even looking for states that are going to have fewer regulations on you, that is a rational motivation for corporations. So therefore, we may start seeing weaker laws for protecting the, the safety of the workers in our environment. These unrestricted trade does compromise national uh, sovereignty because corporations can pick and choose where they need to go and actually play states against each other. So states are losing a little bit of their power in that respect. The concept of fair trade has been touted instead, which is somewhat more complicated and also somewhat of a contradiction that fair trade would result in, in states 
being more interdependent and more cooperative in order to try to uh, make sure that the workers are not exploited, safety regulations are not hurt, environment is not affected in order to have more of a fair trade type system. So this is where a lot of the contradictions come into play is that in order to make the global capitalist system work better, you would need a more coordinated global regime of regulation over corporate activity. And the use of fossil fuels will more than likely continue because as long as they're here and we depend on them so much, we are, yes, making some transition to alternative fuels, but fossil fuels will be continued to be used uh, in our global capitalist system. The democratic ideal has also had some challenges here and some, and some fissures, some fractions. This people's democracy that was so, the, the original intent, particularly in China and Russia, those did fall victim to a, an authoritarian communist party power. The collapse of the Soviet Union uh, was a result of that, the demise of their communist system. China, on the other hand, shifted away from communism into its version of controlled capitalism. So those have been the results of this, these two big, huge experiments of people's democracy that we touched on. The d democracy that was uh, more directly inspired by liberalism has also seen some splits here. Liberal democracy, where we're still looking at rights to privacy, property, freedom to choose. Social democracy has put a little bit more emphasis on equality and less accumulation of wealth and, wealth and power. I'm going to just spread that out somewhat. And this fairly new concept of illiberal democracy could be another word for this modern authoritarianism, where more nationalist leaning, more authoritarian leaders are getting elected because they are becoming a little bit more appealing to voters for several reasons that we talked about. They may be playing on fears of globalization, fears of immigrants, fears of, of terrorism, things like that. But in these systems, you have the semblance of elections for the most part. But once they become into power, they start to push back against the free press. They start to exert control over an independent judiciary and somewhat uh, opposed to minority rights. So those are some of the, the leanings of this, this new authoritarianism that we're seeing. There's a consensus that the democratic capitalism that prevailed, particularly in early 90s, when the, United, when the Soviet Union fell, there was consensus that capitalism had won, communism had lost, and so now start that movement, and that also spurred a lot of the globalization of the 90s as well. However, this consensus did not really hold up because we're seeing so many different varieties that are pushing back somewhat against democratic capitalism. And the, the divide between the welfare liberalists and the classical liberalists in the United States, that also appears to be widening. We are getting a little bit more of the nationalist and the religious sentiments that we've touched on. There's a fear that liberalism is pushing the world into a single, secular, materialistic consumer society. Several groups that are pushing back against that, and it is our nature as humans to bond over our beliefs, over our identity. And so once those start to coalesce, then we will have these groups that may not necessarily be willing to cooperate, coordinate. So we're looking at some potential crises forthcoming that could inspire ideas to motivate action. The definition of a crisis could vary, but we are seeing some things that are sparking new ideas, such as the concern about the environment, and then, of course, what we're dealing with right now with the global e epidemic, what in its aftermath might that inspire as far as some ideologies that have sprung up or coalesced in order to approach problems and come up with solutions.
energy sources, continuing fossil fuels or alternative fuels, rising costs, particularly of uh, college education and health care, increasing inequality in the United States, our infrastructure that needs considerable attention, even in the United States, the, inst the continuing political instability of developing states, because the key to their development is some form of political st stability. Ethnic conflict, as I said, is at the heart of conflict that's in the world today. And we are still looking at the future of where there's going to be more and more people that are going to be needing jobs at a decent wage. Bringing up lots of issues and uh, hate to kind of end this chapter on somewhat of a gloomy note. But as humans, we will continue to come up with ideas that will continue to coalesce people into groups that are going to pursue solutions to problems as they see fit. So that will wrap up this final chapter in the political ideologies class.